Imagine starting from scratch, building a company with over 3,000 customers, selling it to Telstra, the Telco Tech giant, and then leading an ASX listed company. Tell you that I practice if your mind talks to you, and it's like it's always chattering, and you'll feel it when you're trying to go to sleep at night, and you just can't turn your mind off. I'm a deeply selfish person. Like, I care about myself, right? I care about what makes me happy. I care about what makes my small locus of control happy. If you're a CEO, there is no black and white. If it was black and white, someone three levels low in the organization would have made that decision. It comes to you because there is some. So then the really ballsy move was we actually got rid of the division that made money, which actually sounds totally crazy, but we actually thought there's more upside in trucking. Do you yeah. think the Asian countries would just sit back and watch uh, Indians coming over to Australia and taking over like whatever they were planning to do years and years ago? Like Social media is like, deeply addictive. And you'll find the teams that Facebook and Google and those guys have of data scientists that are designed to totally suck you in and get you glued to that screen. You have all of these capabilities and you said, ah, oh, stuff it. I don't yeah. want to do this. It's all about me, mm. whether you like it or not. And I don't, I don't really care, which yeah. I do really respect. I do through my meditation. Every time you lament on the past, you just won't be happier. Sarab, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank it's you. a pleasure to have you on board. Um, look, I have so many questions I wanted to ask you. During the pre-interview, you were someone interesting. Your story is one of its kind also. Hmm. But let's start from the beginning. Hmm. You, were, you started as a software developer, yep. and then you started your own business after hmm. that. Can you tell us a bit more on that? Yeah, totally. So I um, went to high school in Australia, but then to the States for a couple of years. C came back here back in 96. Um, and if you remember back then, this is what, uh, about 30 years ago now, almost, or 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, that's when the internet first kind of bloomed. Um, so I came back here, 10th high, uh, high school, during the holidays, yep. saw how much internet cost in America, saw the price here, thought there's probably a market. So I borrowed four grand for my parents and set up an internet service provider in my bedroom. Four grand. Yeah. I mean, it didn't take a lot to kind of step to a tech startup yeah. back in those days. So I ran that for about um, four, four and a half years through high school, through university, um, had a shop front, you know, two and a half thousand customers, dozen employees. And then I sold that off to Big Pond back in uh, 2001. So did they believe in you straight away, your parents, when you told them, oh, I want to start my own business? Or what was their advice? Um, really? Uh, four grand is not a lot. Yeah. Um, and if it was my kid, you tell them four grand to, to, to have a shot. And look, you know, realistically, from her, like a 98% chance of failure. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow it just kind of succeeded. And I think that's what's actually gotten me so successful through life is that entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. and the ability to actually start something and actually finish it. So where did you get this spirit from? Uh, look, it's from a, your um, mom's side, that side, so, um, one in your family? Or? So Jane's, my surname, the, the kind of the um, sect in our religion or caste that I'm from, um, we're known for, to be business people. Okay. And we're known to be quite hard workers. So everybody that I know, every cousin, every uncle, aunt, we're, we're all in various businesses. Because generally in India, if you're paid a salary, you tend not to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to make money, you tend to um, be in a business sometimes. And in India, it's all about money, yeah? So we're going to talk about India in details down yeah, yeah. the track. So after your startup, you sold it to Big Pond, mm -hmm. to Telstra. Yep. And by the way, Telstra is like the biggest telco provider mm -hmm. in Australia. Yeah. Um, then you started... You jumped into different companies, especially in uh, in SaaS. Mm. And SaaS for our viewers is software as a service, like yep. putting you putting an application in the cloud. Mm -hmm. People go access it without having to have to download the application on site. Yeah, and then they start using it. Mm. Tell us a bit more about this phase of your life. Yeah, totally. So I mean, at the time, I was still doing my software engineering degree. So I used to do that at nights from kind of six to nine p.m. and I'd work during the day. Um, over at UNSW. So did that for quite a few years, about four and a half years took to complete. Um, so when I sold out, kind of did nothing for about three months to figure out like what I actually want to do next. Um, and I kind of fumbled my way into sales. And back then it wasn't called SaaS, it was called ASP, Application Service Providers. This was like way before SaaS was actually a thing. Um, and then I was in sales for about 10 years um, across two or three different companies. And that's kind of where I got the commercialization part of it kind of came together for me. Like so you move from technical to sales? Yeah, moved to technical to sales, yeah. yeah. Um, and often you'll find the best salespeople are actually deeply technical, but have some understanding of people. 
because then they kind of get what they're selling, what the problem is they're solving, and what the product can and can't do. So you tend to have a bit more credibility with the end customer. Okay. Um, so I did that for about a decade. Um, then one of the companies I was at, there was a bit of a disconnect between kind of sales and product and delivery. Um, so then they put me on top of product and delivery. So I, you know, ran the dev team, ran the support team. Um, it was about a, um, I ended up going to about a $50 million business, that division. And then eventually I got put on top of sales as well. So that was the first time I kind of ran in an entire division, kind of from sales, product development and, and support. Mm-hmm. And then you progressed. Mm. You excelled in yeah. the world of business. But obviously in the world of business, you have faced a lot of issues, mm. a lot of struggles. Tell us a bit more about this side of your mm. of your journey. Well, I haven't, I've had a pretty good life. I haven't. Sure, you know, everyone has ups and downs in their life, right? Um, but I've figured out what my core... It's not about your life, your personal life. It's more about business, mm. like your day-to-day. Mm. What did you used to face? Yeah. Dealing, managing people, managing customers, expectation, running um, your meetings yeah. and getting the buy-ins. Mm. How was it for you? Oh, look, it's one of those things. Um, that was brilliant kind of being in sales. Um, and one of the things I do deeply enjoy is convincing people. Um, so either you convince your peers or your customers or management or, you know, the CFO to make sure you get whatever budget allocation you need. Um, I tend to find you have to convince everybody to kind of be on the same page. They'll come on that journey with you. And that smooths off a lot of these kind of bumps that most people otherwise face in their day to days. Does it, do you need the specific skills to do that or how do you do it? Mm. So I think, I mean, there's probably lots of different skills you need, but I think probably the main, main one is to be able to convince someone else to see, to see what you to see what you see okay. and to do that you need to probably spend a moment not in your head and in someone else's mind to understand like how they're viewing the world how they're perceiving it what are they going through and then how do i kind of get them to align to what i want to do okay and how did you do that did you have a special skills or is it just you your personality um oh, it's probably a bit of personality a bit of it to kind of learn but um but what you tend to find is um if you kind of deeply care about something and you figure out what someone else deeply cares about and you align it, it just kind of comes together. So it's just really probably what it is, probably taking the time. Um, instead of just kind of rushing from meeting to meeting to meeting, client to client to client, it's take some time once in a while, figure out like, what what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Uh, what's working? What isn't working? And how do I get everybody around me to be completely aligned on this objective as well? So what about your knowledge? Does, uh, do they do they respect your knowledge? Do they mm. respect or like what you're saying and they have faith in you? And... Well, after being a software engineer, he's kind of moved to a more commercial side. Like you tend to have a greater technical understanding of what you're doing. Um, and you tend to have a better relationship with the, with the dev team and the pre-sales consultants and those kind of guys um, because they kind of view you as their intellectual peer. Um, and because you're generating revenue, right, you're insanely important to the company. Okay. Um, and then clients tend to respect you a bit more as well because they're like, well, he's not just saying anything. He actually understands what he's selling and what problem we're solving and those kind of things. So obviously you've dealt with a lot of business leaders hmm. in Australia. Hmm. What's your view about business leaders in Australia? Capabilities, skills. Um, do you think they're lacking anything? Um, or is there an area like in hmm. that they should be focusing more? As business leaders? Oh, look, it's hard to generalize, right? Because you get so many different types, so many different gradients, so many different colors. Um, I've worked with some horrible managers that, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm not working with them. I've worked with some amazing people that I still keep in touch with today. Um, so it's probably hard to broad brush one generalization across many people. Um, the guys that I see that are not so great, um, small minded, small thinkers, focused on themselves, uh, the ones that I find are quite effective and that I've really enjoyed working with. Uh, try and do something for some greater good. Okay. What's your perception about the CEOs in Australia? Hmm. It's the hardest job in the entire world. It's so easy. Right? Like, I've, I've been a CEO. Right? I was the CEO of a public company for like three years. Oh. Um, and um, when I wasn't a CEO, I used to be critical of CEOs. But when I wasn't, I was like, oh, my God, this is hard. Like, you have no friends. Mm. Like, no one around you actually... It's a lonely job. It's, it's the loneliest job in the entire world. Because no one around you actually knows what you're going through. No one else has the same understanding of the entire organization. There's these finance, sales, support, dev, customers. No one else sees that. And everyone always sees their little silos and is shitty at you for not doing what, what they want for their division. Mm. It is a really, really hard job. And whilst you kind of juggle that, I was a public company CEO, so then I had a board as well. 
So you kind of get crunched between what your board wants and what the company wants. But do you think most of them are real or that most of them are fake? Mm. Do they like deserve the position that they have running companies and having mm. and guiding people across? Well, I think it's um, firstly you got to accept how hard it is to actually do that role. Um, and in most roles that are hard, like you're only going to get a small echelon of people that are actually really good at it. Mm. Like, I don't know if you're like uh, a chess player, right? Probably like 0.1% of people are actually really good at chess. The other 99.9% like me are just like crap and just play online every now and then. Um, so I think there is probably an echelon that are really, really good, but you'll find those are the guys that have just kind of bubbled to the surface. Um, and you'll see in a lot of people's careers, they were like a CEO for a couple of years, but then for whatever reason, didn't work out and they didn't get, didn't get another CEO job. Mm. Um, so they're probably the, the, the fakes, the frauds, the guys that didn't actually learn from that experience that kind of in a Darwinian kind of sense kind of get filtered out. Do you think there's a lot of frauds in Australia? Oh, I wouldn't just say in Australia. I'd say in the entire world, right? In the entire world. Yeah, totally right. Because most people don't do the work to succeed because hmm. doing hard work kind of sucks and it's hard and it's not fun. And it's so much easier just to kind of have the accolades and claim and have everyone tell you how great you are and not, have, not actually have to do the work. So totally. And I think one should be very cautious of who one takes advice from. Hmm. So, obviously, what you've done, you've been involved in all of these big mm. corporates, uh, organizations, and mm. they did employ you for a reason. Mm. What is the, the value add of Surat yeah. being um, as a CEO or senior manager in yep. one of these companies? And what do you think you've added to the society, the Australian society overall, mm. during your work? So, a couple of questions there. So, let me talk about like what I reckon my core differentiator is. Um, so there's three things I'm good at. So it was the technical side, software engineer. I still code. I had to learn to code when I was teaching my younger brother again. Um, so I still do that. Um, so you mentioned your brother. Oh, uh, a younger brother, 15 okay. years younger. So when he was in high 15 school. 15 years? Yeah, when he was in high school learning Java, I had to relearn Java again to kind of teach him. So I'm still quite technical, and that's what that's that's part of me. That's a big part of what I think about in life. Um, sales commercialization, like how do you sell something? How do you make money out of a product? And what I kind of got out of the CEO ship and now what I do now, which is more mentoring other CEOs being on board, is the people management side. So how do you sell a product? Put you on the spot now straight away. And how do you make money out of product? You find a need, you get someone completely addicted to your heroin, and you lock them in and you sell them more and more. Mm. So as long as you do something really good that someone kind of finds some benefit in, and once they start, they can never get off you, you'll do well. Mm. Um but sales is actually insanely complex. A lot of people think that, oh, let me just get a salesperson, right? Um, but you need like this entire scaffolding around. You need pre-sales, you need marketing, you need, you know, telemarketing, probably need social media people these days. You need an SEO person. And most organizations don't build out that scaffolding for a sales organization to succeed. And that's why most sales organizations don't succeed. Mm. I'm sorry to say, it's probably those three things. It's the technical, it's the commercialization, it's the people management. The intersection of them, that, that, that's where I sit. And you don't find a lot of people that have done all three of them are successfully in their career. Hmm. So back to your family, you have hmm. a family, obviously. Hmm. And work and family sometimes don't actually mix. Yeah. You have to sacrifice one. Hmm. Uh, how did you manage to keep a balance between your family life hmm. and your work life? I or did, did you? I didn't. Okay. I didn't. That's right. what I yeah, love I, to I hear. Didn't. No, um... So being a CEO, right, um, we had offices in 13 countries. I was traveling two weeks a month, you know, up in Asia and South Africa, over the Middle East, over to Europe sometimes as well. Um, you can't be great. And you were always traveling on your own, yeah? Yeah, totally right. Yeah, I mean. Exactly. So if people need to know all about this stuff. Mm. I think the life of CEO is the luxury life, and but it is really a lonely life. Mm. It's a lonely life where you have a half-life of about five years. So almost all CEOs get sacked within five years or they get shitty and leave an organization. <laughs> so you actually have no job stability. People think a CEO's job is, is cushy. It is so not cushy. Um, you work insane hours, but you do it. You get paid really well, all right? So you get compensated for it, but you do it because you, you, you care about what you're doing. So when I was married, traveling two, three weeks um, a month, it actually just doesn't kind of work together. Um, so my wife and I were totally blessed. We had twins um, two and a half years ago. One boy, one lovely girl. Um, so they were born in October, and I was still traveling like three weeks a month. Um, were you there when, when they were born? Yeah, totally. Of course, yeah. Yeah. I was there. I, I took like the, the obligatory what, one and a half weeks of uh, pat leave. <laughs> um, and then I realized this is actually not going to work. I actually can't have both. 
I can't be a public company CEO and be somewhat present dad and, you know, and present husband, all those kind of things as well. Because invariably I thought, well, one day I'll come and like the locks will be changed. Um, and then I'll be like, well, shit, well, why do I work so hard, right? Why do I work so hard to write all this money to make all this success um, if I don't get like the personal happiness in life? Um, so then I had a falling out with my chairman. Um, so I finished up around Christmas time. And the original plan was then to go find another CEO job. Um, so that business was a $100 million business, took it from 20 to 100. So you've got to find the next bigger business, right? They're going to grow even more. So that was the original plan. But kind of being stuck and forced at home for like that month over Christmas was probably the best thing ever. Best thing ever. Best thing ever. So that's when I realized, actually, I don't need to go find another CEO job. I can be happy as is. And that's when I kind of re-optimized my life for happiness. And that's where I found the balance between all the different components that I, that I do in life. You mentioned your wife. What does mm. your wife do? Um, she's an anaesthetist, um, specializes in a couple of different areas. She has a bit of plastics, a bit of dental, um, some hip joints, and a bit of IVF. Okay. Do I sense a bit of competition between you and your wife? Oh, she's, she's so much smarter. <laughs> so much smarter. Oh, look, um, I mean, HSC wise, she's so much better, so much harder worker than me. Um, I'm probably a bit more on the emotional intelligence side of things, mm -hmm. but she, she, she's the smarter one. Does she always push you and say, like, uh, go do so some stuff or it's never. like she'll leave you alone? Well, she's, she's never had to because I've been quite motivated myself. So we tend not to need to motivate each other because we're both quite competent. We can't both figure out if if someone's not doing something, there's probably like a deep reason why and they'll figure it out themselves. Mm. Okay. Mm. So um, in life, you have different style of work. Mm. And um, do you believe normally in hard work or smart work? What is your view on that? Uh, you've got to do both. Um, like rarely people do dumb work. Um, if they are, they're probably dumb. And um, maybe that's just what their their life is designed for. Uh, but most intelligent people will naturally just do clever stuff, right? Um, but a lot of really smart people get a bit lazy because um, they kind of skate through school and do okay. They get their Bs and stuff and without having to work really hard. The guys that are rock stars in life, the guys that work really hard and, and are super intelligent. So you you believe in working hard, not working smart, really? I think you've got to do both. Um, to what extent? Is it 80 to 20 or no? how does it work? It's like 100%, 100%. 100%, 100%. Yeah, like you, 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 you can't have 200%. Oh, can you work harder and smarter at the same time? You totally can. Yeah? You totally can, right? So working hard is about how many hours you do. Working smart is much more about what you do. So they're actually completely unrelated. Um, so you just want to do as many hours you can at the most productive thing or the most productive way you can. Okay. So is this something related to your background, mm. to your Indian background? or? Yeah. Is it something that you've learned along the mm. way in Australia? So, um, so my family grew up with, with very little. So when we kind of came here, we, you know, we, we had very little money. There's a lot of immigrants then back in the 80s. Um, so back in there, like, one of the things my parents always taught me was to work hard. Like, we had no fallback, right? Like, if we wanted to eat, we had to go to university. Like, even to go to university was never an option. Like, that was just, like, a thing that you did. Yeah. Uh, doing a master's was never an option. That was just, like, a thing that you did. Um, taking a gap year was not a thing that you did, right? Because you had to actually go and work. Um, so it was just a, like bred into me from like a young age. And you kind of realize after a while, like if I actually work super hard at something, I tend on average to succeed. And success is kind of fun and exciting and quite self-rewarding uh, self and reinforcing. Um, so then because of that, you tend to work harder again and again and again. So obviously you, now you're seeing the wave of migration from India to mm. Australia. And uh, so what is your message to the new Indians, the new kids who are coming to Australia or mm. like, they don't have to be kids, but just yeah. like professionals. What is your advice to them? How can they nav navigate uh, the struggles in mm. the Australian life and how can they succeed Yeah, uh, from well, an Indian perspective? Probably two things I'd say is um, generally if they're coming here now, they're probably quite educated. They're probably coming here as professionals. Um, like you kind of had three waves. You had professionals back in the eighties and you had a whole bunch of Uber drivers for a while. And now you get a whole bunch of professionals again as the immigration policies change. So they're probably naturally pretty clever. So it'll just be, you know, work super hard and figure out what you can do that no one else in the world can do. Like what is your core differentiator that you can do? You can absolutely differentiate and be amazing at and do just that. And cut out all the other stuff in life that, that you otherwise do. Do they have to be focused on, like, focusing on whatever they're doing? Do they have to focus on one stuff and do it really well? Mm. Or they can go horizontally and do try everything? What is your advice to them? So, a couple of things. Um, people who often try many, many things is they tend not to have a lot of ten tenacity. So, tenacity is when you do something and it's hard, you actually keep doing it till you succeed. 
So there is something to actually having a bit of grit to be able to, able to go through and complete something. So it's hard if you go a bit horizontally, you, you draw lots of like half wells, you'll never kind of quite get the water. Um, having said that, if you're doing the wrong thing, totally quit and go do something that's better. Um, but it's not about trying lots of things, it's about quickly figuring out like what are you going to be good at and then just doing it and just doing it amazingly. Okay, excellent. Away from um, business mm. and whatever we're talking about yeah. now, let's step back a bit and look at the you as an Indian person mm. yeah. who lives in Australia. What is your, uh, first of all, do you like Australia? Or what is your view about Australia? I reckon overall? it's the best country in the world. Like I've traveled most of the world and a couple of things I like. It's it's like super safe, right? Like we have probably one of the lowest crime rates in the world. Um, we have mostly like an egalitarian society. So back when I was, was it Menzies, whoever made like a university free back in the day, I remember who it was. Um, but he kind of said that's the great leveler. Like anybody who's competent enough that does go to a reasonable enough school, works reasonable enough hard, will get to a university course. Um, it's not not like in the American system where you have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, or be it's getting more expensive and it's being or it's all hexed anyway, so it's not the end of the world. Um Were you born in Australia or? No, I was I was born in India. Okay. But we left there when I was about six weeks old. Okay. Um so yeah, so I think Australia's probably So you left straight to Australia or you no, went no, somewhere? So we uh, went uh, to Kuwait, lived there for about four years. Okay. Then my god uh, my dad got transferred here. Um and then we went to America for high school for about four or five years and came back here in ninety six. Um, America's a great place to go. Um, like my wife and I, one of the companies I was working on, we were setting up an American office. So she took three months off work, moved to New York. Fantastic. Oh. Uh, newly married, no kids. Like absolutely amazing. But I wouldn't live there because I just like the Aussie values a bit more. Um, Tell us a bit more about the Aussie values, mm, especially in business. So one thing that you find in Australia, and I don't know, maybe there's like some convict origins or something to it, but we tend to have a mostly egalitarian society. Mm. So if you don't like, like, sorry, if you go to, up to Asia, right, um, often every worker will leave after their boss leaves for the day. Yeah. But in Australia, you're like, no, screw you. You get paid more than me. You should work more hours. Like, yeah. you totally say that to your boss, right? Yeah. And you totally challenge your boss, but that's just not done in most places in the world. Mm. So we do have a sense of um, equality across with kind of most workers. Less and less. Why you don't see that in India? Yeah? No. You don't have a voice at all. Wait. Indians, we made the caste system. Like, <laughs> like we love dividing people up together, right? Yeah. And having like a proper hierarchy that, they, yeah. that you're kind of locked into from birth. Okay. So if they are, God forbid, and there would be a war between India and Australia, mm. which side would you take? Mm. I probably wouldn't go to war, but I'm not, not a fighting kind of guy. Um, but support would have to be Australia, right? Like, this is the country that's given me everything that I have. Excellent. Excellent. Mm. So looking like from a political point of view, there's a strong relationship now between Australia and India, mm -hmm. especially in the recent few, the last few years. Mm -hmm. How do you see this relationship? Where is it, where is it heading and how can it improve on, uh, both technology and, and business overall mm -hmm. between the two countries? Yeah. Look, I'm not, I'm not, I guess, a geopolitical guy, but, um, but it kind of makes sense that Australia is kind of dissing itself away from China a bit these days. Um, so it's got to find like another major trading party that's going to buy all the stuff that we have to sell. And that just happens to be India. Um, there could have been any country in the world, but India has a whole bunch of consumers that want to buy a whole bunch of stuff and they want to, you know, export people out here that will get studied up and students and pay out lots of fees to our government as well. Um, so it kind of makes sense why it's kind of working together. Um, so do you think there is a market for whatever we produce here in Australia to India or is it going to be vice versa? Um, look, if you look at how much we export, I, mean, I don't know the actual data. You probably have to look it up. But um, I reckon we probably export a lot more than we import. Um, yeah. generally, most of the developing countries, Australia tends to export a lot more than it imports. Okay. So um, that's what you have. That's is how you see the progress. Mm. And then, you know, uh, we've got kind of defense allies. You know, India's close to America. Anyone that America is close to, you know, Australia is always kind of automatically close to as well. Okay. And you kind of have that little ring around China, right, of all the countries that are kind of, you know. Yeah, we'll get to China out. in one second. Mm. So you're living in Australia. You're living as, oh, obviously, you have an Indian mm. um, heritage. Yeah. What do you think the perception of the uh, of the Australian, mm. of traditional Australian white people, or the Indians who are coming now mm. from India, what is their perception? Do you think, um, is there any way of improvement? Like, mm. do you think there is a way of improvement or they do accept you? as you are in Australia? Well, I've never not felt accepted. Um, and I think it's kind of good, right? Like, um, 
well, it's hard for me to talk as a white Aussie because I'm not one. Um, but I'd imagine if but I was. Well, how do you see it from yeah. your from your angle? Well, like when we. Oh, you don't really care. No, but when we interview people, like for the so. When I'm interviewing CEOs, right, to figure yeah. out which CEOs, I actually don't really care what color, you know, they can be pink, white, green. They can be whatever color they want. Um, it's much more about the components of them. Mm. And by having more immigrants here, you actually have a much a much wider talent pool. Um, and great, big immigration is, is amazing because it's actually kind of helped with a lot of the recruits. Like two years ago, it was almost impossible to get technical staff in the country. Like they were all soaked up. But now there's lots more people. So we can actually go employ more people. Um, you don't have the salary hyperinflation that you had a couple of years ago as well. Mm. So immigration generically, I think, is a good thing. And I think it's probably great for the Indians, right, that are getting out of one country, getting into another country, and possibly building a new life here. But from an Indian perspective, is it, is Australia the the aim target, or they just they use Australia as a stop, and mm. then the target is really the state? Mm. Well, there tends to be three main places you go if you're any student in most countries in the world. It's either Canada, or the US, or Australia. And most people will just end up going the first, first place they actually get their visa approved. So it doesn't matter. As soon as we get our visa, we just we they, get out of the country. They tend not to care. Yeah. No, a, lot, a lot of those countries tend to have like, huge brain drains of all the super educated, super competent people end up leaving the country. What is your view on um, this relationship between Australia and India, mm. this political ties? Do you yeah. think the Asian countries would just sit back and watch... Uh, Indians coming over to Australia and taking over like whatever they were planning to do years and years ago. Like, you care who comes here, right? Because you find uh, people of all ethnic, ethnicities, ethnicities, all countries tend to come to Australia. And I don't think there's a real competition. I don't think China's like, oh, damn, I've got to send more students to Australia than, than India is. I actually think they don't care about us that much from that kind of perspective. I don't think they compete against that. Okay. Mm. So you don't see it as a threat from their point of view at all? No, not really. I mean, no. I, I can't see why, I don't know, for example, I can't see why Indonesia is sending a whole bunch of students here. I don't get why Malaysia would care that India's doing or that Indonesia's doing that or that China's doing that or Japan's doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Enough of the politics mm. and um, India, Australia, China mm. and so on. Yeah. You as a CEO, and mm. obviously you had mm. to take a lot of decisions in, mm. yeah. in your career. Um, first of all, in what uh, style do you operate? Mm. Are you in the black and white decision making style, or you prefer the grey area? Yeah. And what can you tell us about some of the decisions that you've made mm. that had an impact on your life specifically and yeah. the life of your employees? Mm. Something dramatic that yeah. would have had a lot of change. Totally. Um, so a couple of questions. There. So, firstly, um, generally, if you're a CEO, there is no black and white. It was black and white. Someone three levels lower than your organization would have made that decision. It comes to you because there is some gray and there is some complexity and you still need to make a decision and be decisive about it and follow through. So almost every decision that I make is in the gray. You're operating on incomplete information. You've got limited uh, resources. Um, you're not totally sure if the product's right and not totally sure if the pricing is right, but you've got to just do something so you can kind of move forward and learn some more and, and then adjust. So the other question was more around, you know, some of the dramatic decisions. 100%. Yeah. So we, we did a big one uh, about three or four months ago. So I'm the exec chairman of a company called Opal. Um, so we had two things we did. We did like clinical trial recruitment. So if you want, you know, people that got COVID two days ago, so you can, you know, test out the latest, you know, therapy, latest vaccine, that kind of stuff, we'll go find those people. And we and that was generating money and that's what the business originally did. And then we had this new startup, which was an AI platform called TrialKey which was, you know, going to predict the outcome of clinical trials. Building up for three years, almost finished. Um, so did the really ballsy move was we actually got rid of the division that made money, um, which actually sounds totally crazy, but we actually thought there's more upside in trial care. Okay. Can you I'll, explain more? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you in about a year or two if that was the right decision. I think it was <laughs> touch what I hope it was. So basically we got rid of the division that made money. Um Got rid of those staff, sold off that division, held, held some equity in the new entity as well, have someone else who's running that now. Because we thought every dollar we want, we actually want to push into trial key because we think that's actually going to be where the future of this company is. And we actually think that's going to be a much, much greater return than doing what we were doing before somewhat successfully. So when you when you take decisions like that, like mm-hmm. is it based on what? On analysis, on uh, your gut feeling? What do you see? Like, is it your vision? Mm-hmm. Uh, that drives you to make decisions like that, or how does it work? So I find almost every decision you make is kind of based somewhat on gut, and then you find data to either convince you yay or nay. Mm. 
Um, so my gut was, look, you're doing two things. We have limited resources. You can't actually do two things. Yeah. Like, you got to kind of pick one. Um, it's hard enough to do one thing really well in life, but imagine if you're trying to do two things really well in life. It's, it's super difficult. Mm. Um, so we kind of had to pick one. And then it's to figure out, like, which one, which one are you going to back? Which one do you think will actually become, like, this huge multi-billion dollar business? Or which one will um, will grow and be okay, but might not be the great kind of shareholder return that you want? Okay. So going back 20 mm. years now, um, you as a kid, did you achieve whatever you had as a dream? Mm. Like, did you, were you thinking that in 20 years, I'm going to be at this position achieving all of this stuff? Yeah. Or that wasn't really your dreams? When I first got my CIO gig, that was, um, I was probably like 33 at the time, like a decade ago, about a bit longer. Um, CIO, probably said company. I remember telling my wife at the time, if this was my last job in my career, I'd be like, oh my God, I've had, a, I've had an amazing career. To be CIO, probably said company, like that's the dream job for any technical person. And then I got the CEO gig and then I got a CEO of a public listed company. Um, and so in that respect, I actually think I've been super lucky. Like I'm, so I'm 43 now. Um, so what I do, I've worked two days a week across half a dozen companies, um, travel once a quarter and have about a hundred days off every year on kind of uh, very, very holidays and those kind of things that I do. So in that respect, I actually kind of think that I've achieved what I wanted to achieve um, from a lifestyle perspective. And then I've got a lot more micro things that I need to do and that I need to kind of figure out now. Okay. Hmm. So obviously you did achieve, but you work most of the time as a, as a solo. Hmm. You were a solo operator. Hmm. You did. And I, you think, were, I think all CEOs are solo yeah, operators. And you then you were be, focusing yeah. specifically on your success, hmm. on you making money, yeah. on uh, specifically it's all about you, your yeah. life. Um, hmm. What about society around you? Yeah. Do you feel that you need just to give back society something, help, support, mm. or it doesn't exist from your point of view? Um, I think something we spoke about before as well. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a deep... And please be honest, yeah, because I, 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 I really be. respect yeah. your your point of view. I'm a deeply selfish person. Like I care about myself, right? I care about what makes me happy. I care about what makes my small locus of control happy. Um, and that's what I focus on, right? So I actually don't have this yearning, dis- uh, you know, desire to, you know, to cure malaria or solve poverty or any of those kind of things, I'm much more focused on just solving the stuff w- within me because um, that will take a total total lifetime to do. And if I kind of do that, that will probably have some positive impact on, on other people as well. But that's not my motivator. My motivator is to make myself happy. Okay. So would mm-hmm. you like to be remembered like down the track or not really? It's just like you were one number and then you disappeared. Uh, people who have this thing, to have like a legacy they're like oh i need to leave this money to my kids i need this statue built on me that's like that's totally a, a vanity trait mm. um and they think a that vanity a, trait. A, a, totally it's a, a, a total vanity trait and they have this fallacy that if everybody around them tells them how great they are that will somehow make them happier and actually make them greater but when you're dead you're dead right like well i'm not sure i haven't been dead yet yeah, I'll, 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 I'll tell you after, don't know, after. Um, but you know like what once life is gone life is gone right and no matter how many statues you have or how many houses you've built or how many plaques you have with your name it actually doesn't really matter and in a couple of generations you're completely forgotten mm. Mm. Like, like how much do you know about your great grandparents right do you Zero. probably you probably do you know their names even right not really and and they lived full lives like you did right I have no idea, to be honest with they you. Probably did, right? I hope they, <laughs> they did. They probably did. They probably, probably lived full lives. And now that is just completely gone. And the same will happen to us. Yeah, but maybe they didn't have AI, they didn't have the facility just to record their life mm. and give us something like um, that we learn out of them. Yeah. Um, but she, you have all of these capabilities. Mm. And you said, oh, stuff it. I don't yeah. want to do this. Mm. It's all about me, mm. whether you like it or not. And I don't, I don't really care. Which yeah. I do really respect. Mm. You know, like few people would say yeah. whatever you just said. Mm. But maybe most of them, they actually feel exactly the way that you feel. I reckon most people, like 99% of people, are actually still deeply selfish. I reckon only like 1% are truly altruistic people out there. Mm. And they're just, they're just wired a bit differently. And they're super fortunate, super lucky we have those kind of people in society. Um, That just isn't me. Okay. Hmm. So do you have any regrets after all of these years? Hmm. Like you've made your money, you did your study. Yeah. Now you're relaxed. Hmm. Do, you, do you have any regrets whatsoever? 
from a business perspective, personal perspective, both. both. Or, yeah, Actually. yeah, probably one of my greatest failure from a business perspective was that last company I left, Urbanize. Um, so when I left, it was a hundred million dollar business. Um, we grew from twenty to hundred. My CFO took over, absolute rock star. So you grew it from twenty to hundred. Yeah, twenty okay. million. Yep. Um, so it was an amazing journey. Uh, we kind of went through that growth growth cycle. Um, but now it's been three years later. The growth kind of went was forty percent growth every year when I was there. Now it's growing kind of below inflation, if not shrinking every year. And now the market caps about twenty twenty five mil. Um, because investors punish companies that don't grow in the SaaS space. Mm. Um, so I'm like. I probably didn't do a great job, right? That I could not build this model that outlived me. That when I left as the key person, um, the organization just didn't keep growing on this absolutely amazing, successful trajectory. So then that's what I think about now when I work with CEOs and I'm, when I'm on company boards, right? Like, how do you build a system that's going to outlive a single person? Um, cause if I was a truly successful CEO, like, like the Steve Jobs of the world, right? Yeah. He built this amazing company. And even after him, like he's been gone, what, for 10, 15 years? How long has he been gone? Like they're still doing some really cool stuff and they're, they are now the biggest company in the entire world and they have been for quite a while. I, I did not achieve that. So that's probably, probably my greatest regret. regret. What about your personal life? Um, personal life, um, mentioned before, like I'm into the meditation a bit. Um, I wish I was into it younger. Um, cause the older you get, the harder it gets. And the best time to learn to meditate is like when you, you're in your, like your five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. The worst time to learn and try to get good at it is when you're my age and it's when you're in your 40s. So you don't regret that you haven't spent enough time with your family or you made a lot of friends. You don't regret that at all. Just well, like, it doesn't matter. It I, doesn't, it, I spend more time with my family than probably any dad does, right? Now, yeah? Yeah, well, my... Uh, before too? Well, my kids are only like two and a half years old. Okay, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, even when I was working as a CEO, I'd still take two months off every year holiday, you know, with the wife and those kind of things. Mm. But when I was working, I was totally working. That was all encompassing. Um, I mean, if I had my kids 10 years earlier... And I was still a CEO. I'd probably regret that now. Um, but then I saw that was going to be a thing, so I changed my situation, so I wasn't going to regret it. So how do you see the what? What do you see the future of your kids? Mm. How do you see them? Yeah, like their dad, like their mom, a combination of the two, or completely different. So how are you going to push them? Mm. That's my question to you. Like in which direction you're going to push them? So one thing um, I think a lot, of, a lot of parents, perhaps a lot of Indian, perhaps ethnic parents, get get this wrong is to realize my kids are not me. Like, my kids don't exist for me to live my dreams um, and to fulfill my desires. They are separate souls, separate beings, separate entities. Um, so what, what, what's my job in it all? It's, I'm a bit of a custodian, and I've just got to make sure they've got the best possible environment um, to succeed in life. So a couple of things, right? I was mentioned before, like, um, my twins are three years old now. They still don't know what a screen is, don't know what the TV is, the TV's never been on in front of them, don't know what an iPad is, don't know what a phone is. Um, and I think that's an amazing thing. And I will hopefully do that till they're like 20. I probably won't succeed to 20, but as long as I possibly can. Yeah. Um, but it's the, it's the, build that, yeah, but it's the <laughs> build that environment around them. So they have the best. Okay. Mm. So do you have any hobby? Yeah. Do you play cricket? Do you follow soccer, football? Do you I have any to, interest? I used to love sports, but I just don't have enough time anymore. Um, so probably the most thing I do, I meditate a lot. Like that's, that's what I do most days. Um, I spend a lot of time with the wife and the kids, and, and we travel. They're, they're like the three. So kind tell of us a bit more about meditation. Like, mm. how does it work? Um, it's a bit about how I've experienced meditation. So I've, I've done my ten thousand hours. Um, I'll do two thousand hours per year. Um, so I so does it go by hours? Right. Well, you got to do ten thousand hours at anything to be good at it. Okay. Um, well, why ten thousand? I think it's some. It's arbitrary. a random number. It's um Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote this book. I think it might have been Outliers. Yeah. And his theory was to be good at anything in your career, you just have to spend ten thousand hours to do it. So hopefully, the Facebook, uh, not Facebook, YouTube is not. I'm not going to listen to you now, mm. and they they will increase the watch hours to ten thousand rather. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, ten thousand. Finally, yeah. We'll all be in trouble. But I mean, if you look at like when when your career probably took off, it was probably after about ten years of experience. When you've just done your 10,000 hours at sale, the 10,000 hours of technical, like whatever it is in life, I think just as a species, we just need 10,000 hours of practice for the brain to rewire or to remold to be really good at something. Um, so I've done my 10,000 hours. I do about 2,000 per year. So how many hours per day? Oh, usually, so it's two hours per day that I'll do every uh, day. Two hours. Uh, two hours per day. Morning, and, afternoon? Or uh, so just... I did my hour in the morning this morning and I'll do an hour before I go to sleep at night when okay. the kids are, kids are down. Um, and then I'll go off and do a meditation course for about 100 days every year. Okay. And in those ones, you're probably doing about 12 hours per day. Of, uh, so how does it help you? 
Mm. You personally, like, how does it? How does meditation help you? Mm. So there's a couple of different gains. One, there's all different types of meditation, right? It's like saying, you know, how does exercise help? Well, exercise does lots of different things, lots of different, different people. Um, so the meditation that I practice, there's probably two main benefits. One is, um, you know how like your mind talks to you, and it's like it's always chattering, and you'll feel it when you're trying to go to sleep at night, and you just can't turn your mind off. What does it mean? You're hearing voices, like other people's voices? No, 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 no. So I'm trying to explain like what a normal person experiences. Yeah. Um, that constant discursive uh, rhetoric in, in your own mind, that's actually completely optional. Mm. Like I've not heard my internal dialogue for years and years because you can actually like atrophy out that part of your mind. And the reason that happens is you actually don't have full control over your thoughts. Um, and we're just born that way, right? We're just born to not have control over our thoughts. Um, so that's probably the first benefit is you get full control over your thoughts and you, you lose that, uh, internal, um, rhetoric. Okay. So the benefit that gives you is when you're in one moment, you're in that moment, you're not replaying an argument you had with your wife yesterday. You're not thinking about the lunch you're going to have next. You're not thinking about other stuff. And when you've got your entire mind unified on a single topic, you're just more focused, more present, and you're just smarter. Because mm. every part of you is focused on this and the memories are actually being locked in properly into your mind. So that's probably like half the benefit is just to be kind of controlling your thoughts, just be a bit smarter. I mean, it'd be like if you're an athlete, right? If you went to the gym two hours a day, you'd be fitter than if you didn't go to the gym for two hours a day. Yeah. It's the same, but it's the mental version. Um, so you've got the mental version, which mm, is really good. Yeah. Because you're fit, but you still have your physical. How do you keep your physical? I don't do enough. So I go to the gym about three times a week, but I, I don't do enough. And you can't succeed at everything in, in life. So you've got to pick out what you're going to be average on and what you're going to be great at. Mm. So I've kind of picked the physical stuff. Yeah, I could probably weigh a bit less, could exercise more, could have more muscle definition. But I'm I'm happy enough. Okay. So if I just um if I just come up to yeah. you and say, look, Sarah, how how do you measure success? Because obviously you measure success and you measure uh, smart so many times. Yeah. Being smart is really debatable. Mm. Everyone's got different views on mm -hmm. uh how people are smart. But success, how can you measure success in life? So I think everyone has their own measure of success, um, whatever they're optimizing for in their own life. Um, so some people optimize for fame, right? I just want to be known by everybody. I want a legacy. I want statues built on me. I want people to sing songs about me. Some people optimize for money. Some people optimize for health. Some people optimize for family. For me, what I optimize for is happiness. Like how do I build an environment around me that matches my So life? money doesn't matter from your point of view. I only say that now. You're contradicting yourself now. I only say that now that yeah. I have enough. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> that <you're> enough. <laughs> if I didn't have enough, I'd be like, no, I need, exactly. I need some more. But I've got, I've got enough, right? I've got more than I'm probably going to spend. Um, I don't have a need. Look, I really I respect mm. uh, yeah. your point of view because you really, you, you're one of you who just dare to say stuff like that, mm. which is really good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Keep yeah. Um, so I don't have the need for conspicuous consumption. Like, I don't need to buy expensive stuff so people think I'm better. Um, so as soon as you get rid of that, you tend to not need a huge, huge uh, amount of money. So I've got enough. Not super wealthy, not super poor, somewhere in the middle, enough that, enough that I'll be happy every day. Okay. Excellent. Look, Brainsplot, when we started Brainsplot, the whole concept, the whole idea mm. was um, was all about technology and yeah. the impact it has mm -hmm. on people's lives. Mm -hmm. Whether for the good or the worst, it doesn't matter. Mm. But technology must have, have had a huge impact on your life. Mm. What do you see? What, like, what was the the impact of technology on your life? Yeah. And the other questions: mm. Do you regret working in technology, or was it your the best choice mm. that you've made in your life? Let me start with the latter question. I remember talking to my dad in like the eighties, early nineties. I was like ten, twelve years old. Um, he was saying, "There's something to these computers. They're going to be a thing one day." Yeah. This was back in the day of, of punch cards, right? And we had our first computer at home and it was like a, a monochrome uh, black and white screen kind of thing. Um, so like, I was totally born at the right time um, that this whole computer technology uh, revolution came. I did my startup when the internet boom just started. I did super well. Just kind of rode that wave through. And now we've got the next wave that I'm lucky to be part of, which is like the AI wave. Um, and yeah, touch wood, I'll, I'll ride that wave through and, and do super well. That will have a huge, great impact to a lot of people. Mm. So... You don't actually regret it. You think you made the right choice? Oh, totally. totally. So you, you couldn't see yourself in um in a medical field or any other fields, or you no, couldn't so do that. You had not, a try. No, no, I've never tried medical. I mean, I 
I was just almost kind of brainwashed. I was like, well, what else am I going to do? Tech. I'm good at tech. I understand yeah. tech. I've got a startup. Um, so I talked to my wife about this. So she's medical. Um, so I would not fit the medical mold. Like one thing about me is like rules are not my thing. Conformity is not my thing. And medicine, there's a lot of rules. There's a lot of conformity. And you've got a lot of set processes for lots of really, really good reasons. But that's just not me. So I would not fit in that space. Um, finance wouldn't really work for me. Law, I'm not into arguing about things. Um, so I'm, I just haven't defined the right career. And I'm super lucky that I did. Excellent. So what's your advice to um, the new generation, the young generation yeah. now? People are just... Uh, starting their career now, or they they're not sure which which way they have to go. Do you yeah. advise? What is your advice to them? Yeah. So what I say to most people just just work harder. Like there is actually no shortcut. Like the lazy people will be like, yeah, just work smart, not hard. No, no, you actually kind of got to do both. Um, study more. Like I did my undergrad. I've done two masters. Um, like you just need to you need to like fully form your mind and be super competent in what you do. And that it's just hard work. There is no shortcut to that. And you, you one of the people, one of the few people that don't actually follow social media, correct? So you're not really active. No, not social- really. No, I mean my LinkedIn is totally managed by the marketing guys at work. Um, so when someone says, oh, "I loved your post," I could be like, "Oh yeah, which post was that?" <laughs> <laughs> and then I own up. No, it's actually managed. I don't know what gets posted. No, I've got, I've got no, no, I've got no need for it. Like, I've got my friends. We call each other. We text each other. We've got WhatsApp groups. I don't need kind of. But do you think media. you can survive without social media on the track? Well, I seem to be. Yeah, I seem to be surviving. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, because uh, you're mm-hmm. not doing much these days besides yeah. just doing but the I meditation. What, I think what you'll find is um, social media is like deeply addictive. Um, and you'll find the teams that Facebook and Google and those guys have of data scientists that are designed to totally suck you in and get you glued to that screen. I figure they're going to be so much better at that than I am. So then I'm like, well, let me just consciously make a decision to, to limit how much I consume. Okay. Excellent. Look, uh, there's one person I would love mm. to talk about is your dad. Mm. Yeah. Um, you have mentioned him a few times. Obviously, mm. had a lot of impact on your life. Yeah. Do you think he would be watching you now? And mm. uh, what would he say about his son? I hope he'd be proud. Um, so that's probably where I learned the hard work from. So he like topped his university in mathematics. Um, he's the one that kind of got out of India. You know, um, even when I was young, like he was working three jobs, you know, working 20 hours a day. Um, my parents would spend half their money on school fees because they want to send us back to the best school. So my parents made huge sacrifices. So, and it's hard to succeed in isolation. Like you actually need all these people around you to help you out, be it, you know, your dad, your mum, your siblings, your friends, your mental society. And he was absolutely a phenomenal part of that. What would you say to your dad now? Um, I don't know. I wouldn't have a lot to say to him. Well, he's gone, right? There's actually nothing you can say to someone who's gone. So you um, don't talk to him still? No. You don't say, oh, dad, that's what I'm being going through. No? No. So there's a specific reason that you'll find is, um, again, I optimize my life for happiness. I'm very aware of what's going on in my mind um, as I do through my meditation. Every time you lament on the past, you just won't be happier. So every single time you talk to somebody who's no longer with you and you lament and you kind of hang on to their memory and try to kind of keep it real – it will actually decay away from your happiness. So no, I, I don't. I don't feel the need to. Are you serious about that? About which part that it decays from happiness, or that yeah. I don't feel the need to? Both of them, really. Tell me. So one thing that you'll find is the the time that you're most happy is when you're in the present. The time when you're least happy is when you're thinking about the future, thinking about the past. And what most people don't have is the ability to think about the present. So what's the future for Sarah? Hmm. Well, as you said, I don't think about it. Um, well, I'm, I've got a pretty good right now, right? I've got a pretty cool life. I do my 100 days a year of meditation. We go, we book, up, we book our next couple What's of What's the next plan? Well, what is Rob going to do? Just retiring and that's it? Yeah. You know? Well, I'm on these half a uh, dozen company boards and I'm still ambitious in the sense that I'll get on more boards and I'll try to get into larger companies, large companies, learn more around how organizations actually run and how CEOs work and how this whole kind of model kind of comes together. Um but I'm kind of happy and it's content and it's kind of working and I'll just kind of keep doing this. And, you know, over 10 or 20 years, I'll hopefully be on like ASX 100 boards one day and get on to larger and larger companies. Excellent. Hmm. Look, all the best in your future. Yep, it thank was you. Uh, great talking to you hmm. and uh, hopefully we we'll stay in touch. Totally. Sure. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> great. Thank you very Thanks, much. Buddy. Thanks, Thanks. Oh, you. Great. Thanks, Thanks. It was good fun. Yeah. Good fun. It's good fun to have a chat. Yeah. Hmm. Did you, were you bothered with any questions or like, 
Is this no, what you really. expected or something else? No, it wasn't bothering the question. The only kind of critical feedback I'd give to yourself is often you'd ask like two or three questions at once. Yeah. Um, which kind of means, well, I've got to remember the three questions you asked and I've got yeah. to store that somewhere and then answer one by one. And I'll be halfway through your response and be straight on to the next question. Yeah. So I think pause a bit and um, and break up the questions to give each one enough time to be fully answered. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then we'll have like three hours discussion. Yeah. Yeah. You probably will. Or, or you probably will <laughs> just, just ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we are limited to the actual time. Yeah. Because you, you told me you only have one hour. So mm. I have to do as much as I can yep. in one hour. But thank you for your mm. feedback. We just, we we'll definitely take this one on board. Mm. 100%. Yeah. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Tom. Excellent. Thank you.